Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading the show. This is Garden Fork Radio. It's an eclectic DIY show. We talk about all sorts of what I think are interesting things. I have this podcast and a YouTube channel also called Garden Fork. Today, we're going to talk about hooking your house up to a generator or hooking a generator up to your house. And joining me are Aaron from The Impatient Gardener and Will from The Weekend Homestead. Hello, guys. Hey, Hi there. <laughs> it's that awkward pause. <laughs> well, who's going to talk first, right? I always thought ladies first, you know, but I'm just going to step all over your introduction, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of my videos about how to safely hook up a generator to your home, uh, I noticed started literally skyrocketing about a month ago. And um, Will, who is my analytics expert, took a look at it and said, you know, Texas going through this giant power outage coincided with the same time that your video was skyrocketing. And then I just made another video about how to safely hook up your home to a generator with extension cords. That'll be premiering today or tomorrow. And then Will and Aaron were like, well, let's talk about generators on the show. So here we are. Great minds think alike, right? Well, I, th I think really one of the things to talk about, and I know that there's a lot of stuff in the news about people buying and there's a run on generators in Texas. And if you go online, all the transfer switches and all this stuff, but there's a ton of people asking questions all over the place and all these forums and Facebook. So I think timing to talk about something like this is perfect. Yeah. So, um, I, I in, I have, I think I have a lot of experience with generators cause I've gone through different iterations. I have three of them right now. <laughs> um, and Will, you've experienced in generators. And Erin, um, I thought Erin could ask us questions because she's curious about generators. Does that work? That works for me. Okay. Perfect. Do you have any questions, Erin? <laughs> <laughs> I do have questions. So we actually do have a generator. We have a small generator. And um, we have it mostly because we are in big trouble if we get a storm and our sump pumps don't work. So we can use it to turn on a few lights and whatever. It's not a whole house generator, but it keeps us from flooding, basically, if we run into a power outage. And it came in handy. Um, well, it would have come in handy last year when we got flooded if the sump pump itself <laughs> hadn't broken. But um, we did we did use it um, after we got that fixed, and it was great. But what I don't know is I really know nothing about plugging it in the right way because I know there are smart ways to plug in generators and i know there are very dangerous ways to plug in generators so those are my like how do i not kill somebody or blow something up when i'm using a generator wow that's a great question what do you think will uh that, that that's actually right up my alley because i am a big advocate of safety as you know as a retired firefighter i talk about this stuff all the time but I would say the number one thing that people need to understand about generators is don't run this thing in your garage, don't run it down in your basement, make sure you're a good distance away from your house before you start, especially when running it because there's a number of reports already even coming out of Texas where people are injuring themselves or getting sick because they are doing it for the first time. So my number one item that I talk about is safety first, which is make sure that you're on you know a good level surface when you're setting it outside. Don't put it by a window or door and whatever you do, just never run it in your garage because it's not going to end well. Yes. So for everyone, we're talking about portable generators. Um, instant on automatic generators are a whole nother topic. They started about 10 grand. Uh, uh, a portable generator you can get for six or seven hundred dollars. I'll link to some that I like in the show notes here. But with a portable generator, which is what I have, we all three have, there are basically three smart ways to hook it up to your house and one really bad way. So let's talk about the bad way first, Will. Um, and that's called a backfeed cable. I call it the suicide cable. Anytime you're modifying an extension cord to make it work for your system, I always kind of question it because there's probably a reason why it only hooks up one way and it's specifically so you don't injure, especially the people who are trying to help you, the linesmen and people in your home and things like that, where you want this thing to work. But when you're back feeding electricity into your house and you don't have any safety mechanisms in place, it can get very dangerous very quickly. Yeah. If your neighbor comes over and says, oh, hey, I made this cable. 
He's going to plug it into the outlet on your portable generator and plug it into an outlet in your house and say, oh, you're fine now. Uh, don't. <laughs> yeah, go. that the biggest piece is, is, you know, even though a generator isn't producing the same amount of amperage that the service coming into your house is, it's still enough service that can easily injure or kill somebody. So anytime you modify a cable or something like that to take out the safety features of it is always a dangerous situation. Yeah. I don't mean to harp on the safety part of it, but it is kind of serious, the generator yeah. stuff. So, Aaron, are you running extension cords from your generator to the sump pumps in the basement? The generator's outside? Yes, correct. And that works just fine. Um, the video I just made is about how to safely use extension cords with your generator. And, and your husband, who we call Mr. Much More Patient, I'm sure is on top of this because I've never met him, but he just seems like he's on top of that kind of thing. Yeah, he's a handy guy, which is great. But, you know, I do like to know how these things work because um, you just never know. I mean, I would if he's gone or something and I would have to do this because I actually don't trust some of my neighbors to come <laughs> over and know what they're doing with this. So, you know, I like to know these things for myself. It's good to have that knowledge no matter what I think. The biggest I, I, thing. Oh, go ahead, Will. Oh, I was going to say is, you know, the the most important thing is to figure out what you're going to run with your generator long before you actually need your generator. Because I know there's a number of people who are buying generators now because they're in a pinch and I'll oh, just give me whatever you got. And then they try to run an air conditioner and all these other appliances and six refrigerators and whatever else they have going in their house. And you have to be a little smart about it. So if you have a little suitcase generator, you're probably going to run smaller things. If you got a wheel cart generator that has a, you know, let's say 5,000 or 7,000, um, capability that then all of a sudden you have a scenario where you can run more things. So the first thing you do before you hook up your generator is think of what you're hooking into your generator. Yeah. Like the, the with a portable wheel generator, you can run your refrigerator, your microwave, uh, blow dryer, that kind of uh, heat, you know, space heaters. You have to stagger the use of them. Uh, if you're running your microwave oven and, you know, four space heaters, off of extension cords from your generator, that might be taxing things a bit. You'll know when the generator starts to like a brrrr, that you've kind of hit a limit. And the other thing you need is quality extension cords, 14 gauge or ideally 12 gauge extension cords. The little brown ones, the cheap ones from the dollar store uh, are not what you want. So <laughs> just don't use those. And then you can actually buy as an add-on to your portable generator a really cool extension cord that has on the generator end the big fat round connector that goes into the 220 volt and then in the other end it has four to six to eight 120 volt outlets in it and you could run your appliances right from there that's a really safe way it's expensive but it's very safe so common sense don't run extension cords under rugs or under a stack of cardboard because extension cords do heat up. And I think just be careful and think about how much power you're pulling. Does that make sense, Aaron? Yeah, it makes it makes total sense. And I love that idea of um, the extension cords you mentioned. And in that way, I could keep that. We can keep that right by the generator. It's all right there. Don't have to go hunting around through our sort of collection of extension cords and it's all it's all ready to go yeah it's it, they're probably like 60 80 bucks i think they're not cheap but they have a lot of copper wire in them so that's going to be expensive but they're made by someone that knows what they're doing as opposed to your neighbors like oh yeah i got this thing <laughs> well right that's that's my fear right there oh don't worry i got something in the garage that'll work I think one of the other things, too, is think about how, you know, your house isn't necessarily designed to run extension cords into. So you also have to think of how to safely run these things into your house, because ultimately the generator is going to run out of gas at some point in time. You're going to have to walk outside in your flip flops and T-shirt, you know, in the middle of the night to go dump more gas in this thing. And you want to make sure that you don't have a whole bunch of trip hazards and like a maze of wires running through your house. So sometimes a little thought of where to go through and doorways aren't always necessarily the best way to go into your house with extension cords. I always recommend, you know, cracking a window because you're not necessarily going to be walking in and out of a window throughout the day, which could cause a trip hazard issue. 
Yeah, the other thing is to not put your generator right near that cracked open window because the carbon monoxide will go inside the house. Absolutely. <laughs> so why don't we step up here and now you're like, okay, I want to be an adult. I want my portable generator, but I want to tie it into the uh, breaker box in the basement, the uh, service panel, as it is called in your basement. And there's two ways to do that. One is called a transfer switch, a manual transfer switch. And the other one's called a generator interlock. The transfer switch is more complicated and expensive. The generator interlock is much simpler and less expensive. What do you think, Will? I, I will say this, that both of those solutions are awesome. Can I give everyone a homework assignment? Sure. The homework assignment is go to your panel on a day when the power is on and everything is running good, turn all the lights on your house and make sure you have a really comprehensive list of what every one of your switches in the basement does. So you're not doing the guessing game of, well, I think this is the bathroom or I think this is the fridge. If your panel looked like our panel did when we bought our last construction project, the, the person had just handwritten and then crossed off and then handwritten and then crossed off. So you didn't know what switch was what, but before you get an interlock or before you get a uh, manual transfer switch know what's in your breaker and which switches do what because it'll improve the quality of how that equipment runs after the fact Aaron is your circuit panel nice and neat and labeled with a label maker you know that circuit panel that will just describe that's ours <laughs> <laughs> it's serious though because I mean in an emergency let's say there's a storm that just came through and you just survived through a storm and there's power out and the kids are in the house and they're scared in the dark and you got to get this thing set up. Not having to think through like, oh, I think number seven was the bathroom or number three was the well or number five is the refrigerator. Instead, having them written down, one, you won't overtax your generating system. And two, effectively, you can do it pretty easily without having to think a lot about it. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is if uh, the manual transfer switch, you have to plan because an electrician has to come install that there's more wiring and essentially the, the manual transfer switch is another service panel which is providing power from the generator to your home to select circuits um, depending on how big of a transfer panel you buy and they get expensive they're like two three four hundred dollars with a generator interlock you're feeding power into your main panel in such a way that you can't turn on the generator breaker if the utility line breaker is turned on, one of them has to be off before the other one will turn on. And it's a simple means of a piece of metal that slides back and forth, basically. Um, but your jet, your portable generator is not going to run every breaker, every circuit in your house. So you just have to do some planning. I think it's kind of fun because you realize where wires go in your house. So. Well, that and the other thing is you can also look at your panel and see if there's any issues or anything like that. I mean, a lot of people don't think about oh, I, I made a joke the other day on Instagram. Uh, we were fixing some wiring in the house and I said, you know, the electrical part of your house is kind of the thankless part. Nobody walks in your house and goes, oh, my gosh, Eric, your light switches are amazing. You know, they always say yeah. your floors or your windows and stuff. But if you're thinking about these things, taking a look and cleaning up the clutter around your electric panel making sure it's labeled are good first steps before you decide to get an interlock or those types of things. Because ultimately in an emergency, you're gonna have to get over there, you know, relatively quickly, set up all the stuff that you need to turn on and turn off whatever. And if there's eight boxes of paperwork and you know, the old stuff from Aunt Edna's estate and everything like that all piled around your electric box, you're gonna have a bad time. Aaron, do you have central air conditioning? We do, yeah. So a portable generator will not run that. Yeah, so I was going to ask you guys what your philosophy is on generators because the way, way way I've always sort of thought of them is that I want to be able to run the things that we need to keep the house safe, which is like the sump pump. Um, I want to be able to make a cup of coffee, and <laughs> I mean, I mean, it'd be nice to run the fridge, although it's you know because I don't feel like I mean we have been fortunate in that we haven't had like multi day you power outages. Generally, it's 24 hours is about the most we've ever had since we've been at this house. So it's, it's more sort of comfort type things or, or just the, just the few things that you need to sort of get by. And if we don't have a hot water heater for, it's fine. We could, but, and running the well pump is nice to do too. So you can flush toilets and mm -hmm. stuff. 
So that's sort of how, how I think of it. But do you guys, when you're thinking about generators, are you thinking about essentially living living life as as normal? What you know, off of your generator, or are you more prioritizing things? You're prioritizing. What do you think, Will? I, I agree 100 percent on priorities. I I think of like, do I need like you said the water? The first thing I think of is, can I keep my refrigerators cold? Can I keep the water running in my house? Can I have some reasonable lights on in the house to be able to navigate the house without having a bunch of flashlights? You know, those are kind of the first things that I thought of. The microwave, actually, we don't even power on our generator system. I don't power the microwave on that. But I do power the electric that goes to my gas stove because without the electric being on, the ignition source on my stove won't run. So you can't manually light my electric stove because it's a newer one because of a safety feature. They don't let the gas just run without the electric being hooked up. So we made sure that our electric was hooked up on that, which is something that a lot of people might not think of. Yeah, I actually didn't know that's how they made stoves now. So that's good to know. My stove came out of a uh, 1950s Vagabond camper trailer, which is still in my neighbor's yard that I can see from my kitchen window. And um, it doesn't require any electricity. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you just have to basically turn on the gas and take a match or a lighter and put it in there, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah Aaron, I mean, the portable generator will run your well pump. It'll run your sump pumps. It'll run your refrigerator. It will run a washing machine, but not an electric clothes dryer. It'll run a gas clothes dryer. Um, water heater, it'll run a gas water heater, not an electric. It'll run a heat pump water, domestic hot water heater. So you're... With the with the portable generator, you're you're camping in your house, but you do have some lights. You're if you have cable TV or a satellite dish or something, it will work. You can watch TV. It's just you have a lawnmower engine running right outside your living room, uh, <laughs> and also right. you can't a portable generator. You can't run twenty four seven. They're they're made to run about six eight hours, and then you need to turn them off, and you let them rest, and then you can turn them back on again. I have some neighbors that run them more than I do. Um, I mean, it depends on the manufacturer and it depends on your own tolerance. But yeah, I think you could easily, with the generator you have, if it runs your sump pumps, you can also run a couple more things and be able to make your cup of coffee. The other thing to think about also, and I mean, this is on talking about just creature comforts and things like that, you know, your cell phone, being able to charge your cell phone so you can get a hold of people in an emergency, have an iPad to entertain the kids and that kind of stuff. You can also buy, and one of the things we did was we bought some of those, um, like, battery packs that have the USB ports on them. Yeah. And we just throw them in a drawer, and they're charged up. So then if there's a power outage and you need to charge your phone instead of worrying about, hey, you know, do I have an outlet in my house I can plug in for USB? Instead, just plug into that, and you can easily get two or three charges out of some of them that are on the market today. Would you be interested in kind of the behind the scenes and inside the mind of Eric and what goes on to make the podcast and the videos? You can do that if you want to support Garden Fork, the YouTube channel, and our podcast here. You can become a Garden Fork patron. Uh, it starts at five dollars a month, which is what a nice cup of coffee. And for that, you get stuff updates. Every stuff. How's that for a word? Basically, uh, through the Patreon app and email, I post things that I don't post to Facebook or Instagram or include in the email newsletter. Uh, It's an after show for almost every podcast, plus photos and little screen grabs of projects I'm interested in or stuff that I find interesting that um, I kind of just want to share with people that are part of the core group, people that know who I am and and I know who you are. And um, it's a cool group of people. What if you want to be a part of it? Uh, There's information below about signing up or you can go to patreon.com slash garden for All right. Thank you. So I'm a big fan of the generator interlock. I had a manual transfer switch and then I switched over to what's called the generator interlock. And, but it's not compliant. It's not code compliant in all counties in the United States. So you have to check with your local people. And I would really suggest having a professional install it. 
Um, I know how to do it, but my neighbor is a licensed electrician and he does side jobs and it took him less than two hours. And it's like, he put in a whole new service panel. I have the GE 100 with like 32 circuit breakers, which I don't need because I have this tiny house, but it's, I'm very, very happy with it. So I would suggest the interlock rather than the transfer switch. And if you're going with the extension cord, buy the, buy the big rig that ties that specifically ties into the generator 220 volt with what I call a spider box, but it, it's just a series of 120 outlets on the other end of the cord there. So, Is there a specific name for that? That I should, like if I went to the stores or something specific I should be looking for that that extension cord is called? Well, talk amongst yourselves and I will consult the World Wide Web and uh, <laughs> I'll find that name. I think it's a 220 to 110 uh, converter cable. I believe is what okay. it's called. Okay, perfect. A, lo a lot of people have them in the camping industry because they'll hook them up to the connections and use their electrical outlets and things like that at the campsites and stuff. So we see them all the time. There's actually one manufacturer that makes one where um, it plugs into the generator and then there's actually a brick that has a number of little doors that are closed on the outlet. So then if it's raining outside or whatever, it's a little bit more weather tight than just the one that has the plug on the end. So you just have to kind of decide where you're going to be using it and if you have a dry place to do this. So that's that's kind of an important part. Good to know. One of them is called a convenience convenience cord or universal extension cord. Um, I just typed in portable generator extension cable and I got all sorts of stuff popped up. So... Perfect. Hey, Eric, I do have a question for you. So you just made a comment that you went from uh, a transfer switch to an interlock. I have a transfer switch right now. I'm just curious, what were some of the reasons you went with the interlock? I know that it's significantly price difference, but is there any benefits to that type of service versus having a separate interlock panel? The interlock panel limits what circuits you control. You when you buy the gener the in the generator transfer panel, it's essentially a mini service panel, a mini circuit breaker box. And I bought a less expensive one, which had six circuit breakers. One, two of those had to be dedicated to the well pump because the well pump is 240 volt. So you need two 120 circuits to run that. So I had four circuit breakers to run things in my house. So I had the refrigerator and my furnace, so that took up two breakers, and then I had a couple lights in the house, and that's it. And so I was in a, if I was in a room that I was like, oh, I just wanted to turn on a light in here, you couldn't. With the interlock, you're powering the whole panel with your portable generator, but it's up to you to use your math brain to not tax the portable generator with the amount of lights you have on and devices running in different rooms, you selectively energize the power in different rooms by just flicking on and off by looking at your list that you've made ahead of time. But it's just, it's cheaper, simpler, and easier. When you tie in a transfer panel into your main panel, there's a lot of rewiring that goes. You have to rewire every circuit breaker because they're, you're essentially twinning the circuit breakers. And the interlock is so much easier. So I'm actually in the process of designing a new system and I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to go interlock or the other system. I like the idea of the interlock because in the space where I'm putting it, I don't have room for another panel. So I've been trying to rack my brain. And now that I've rewatched the video about the interlock and see how easy that is, I'm, I'm potentially going to go that direction with it. By the way, I'd like to point out to everyone that wants to start a YouTube channel and they get all obsessed about having the best DSLR and the best microphone and the most expensive everything. That's my most popular video. It has something like over a million views. I shot it at my sister's house on an iPad. Yeah, it was it, it was interesting. I, I, I went back through and I was looking through the videos and the analytics and stuff like that. And it like not to share your analytics or anything like that, but it's interesting to see how a group of videos are just kind of cruising along in kind of like in a catalog. And then all of a sudden something happens and then that becomes the trend item and it just rockets 
you know, yeah. past everything. Like not even like one or two times. We're talking 10, 11 times. It's it's pretty amazing how that happens. Yeah. So I want to go 180 here and we're going to talk about something that actually uses electricity. And that is Aaron's LED grow lights and this kind of dark cavern in her basement that I've seen glimpses of in videos, but it's where you start all your seed seedlings. Yeah, it's like a like a you know mad scientist laboratory down there. <laughs> You've got mylar. It's, it looks like part lunar lander, part restaurant shelving cart, and then there's plants growing. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you. We got that dialed in now, and I am super excited about how it works. So this is the unfinished side of our basement. So this is this is, and this is an old house. Our house is um, eighty some years old. So it's an old house and an old basement, and you know all the sort of creepy things that that happen with that. But I just got, um, like you said, restaurant shelving. It's that cheap wire rack shelving, um, four feet wide. And uh, and six feet tall, and because I can't go any taller because that's <laughs> as tall as my basement is. <laughs> so, so um, and then to maximize the lights, and this is this is one hundred percent my my thought. I don't know that I've ever seen this anywhere else. I just thought it seemed like a good idea because when you look at grow tents, which I recognize, well, grow tents, of course can't come mostly out of the cannabis industry. And, and I think if you're ever trying to figure out something about growing plants inside, go to the cannabis industry and find out what they're doing Yeah, because they've been doing it for a really long time. Those people know their lights, they know their grow tents, they know all that stuff really well. So they're, they're, you know, they created, they invented all this stuff and the rest of us sort of home gardeners are just like discovering led lights. They've been using them for, for ages. So we have wrapped these rolling carts with a thick six mil mylar and it's you know, like white vinyl on the outside and on the inside, it's sort of a, you know, diamond cut reflective mylar. And the reason I did that, I thought, well, this is kind of like creating a grow tent and this is, this is maximizing the light that's in there. So the light is going to bounce around and we're really going to maximize all the light that is shining on those plants because of course this side of the basement is completely dark. So what's happened though, is that, um, I have, as I do with everything related to gardening, um, outgrown what I had. So this year I had to add a second set of shelving in part because a lot of the plants that I brought in to overwinter, I just left down in the basement under grow lights this year. Cause I just didn't want to have them spread out all over the house. And I didn't want to have to move those out of there. So I've added another rack but because our basement is small, this is taking up quite a lot of space. But since they're on wheels, we've actually spent most of yesterday and actually Saturday too, um, rigging this up so that all the extension cords run up to the ceiling and then over to the outlet. And each one is on timers and all those good things. But I can slide those two carts together facing each other. Oh, so it's almost, it's almost fully enclosed so that there's no light leakage. So I'm maximizing lights. I also worry a little bit about, I mean, I'm not really down there. And the latest, the most recent grow light I got actually came with glasses that you're supposed to wear around your LED lights, um, which I'm, I, they're goofy as heck, but I actually might do it because just trying to set that system up the other day, I came out of there with a pretty good headache. But I'm able to slide those racks together. Um, they take up a minimal footprint and there's lots of lights in there. I've got some clip-on fans to turn on once I actually have some seedlings in there so that there'll be good, still be good airflow. And then when I need to get in there every day to water them or check on them or whatever, I just slide one back and I create a little alley and I've got all the space I need to work in there. And the cool thing is the LED lights do not draw a lot of power as opposed to like the old school grow lights, which would suck, just make your electric bill skyrocket. Yeah, I um I noticed a big I mean I I still have one fluorescent light that I'm using down there um because it still works and it's it's fine. But as I add more lights or upgrade lights, I've been going to LEDs because of that because when I first started doing grow lights even though I didn't have many, I noticed a spike in our electric bill from running those lights all the time because I run them, you know, 14 hours a day. So yeah. um there is a power draw there. All right, I I have to ask a a grow light question because I don't know anything about grow lights. 
can I just go to the home improvement store and just buy some LED lights they have on the shelf and, and do the same thing if I wanted to have like grow lights or not? Or I just, how does that work? Like, can you, do you have to buy a special light bulb? Eric, I think you're totally the expert on this because you've done videos on this, right? Right. Um, well, actually, I have to make a – I just use the LED shop lights that you can buy at Costco that are like usually on sale for 20 bucks. The The LED – it looks like a faux fluorescent bulb, but it's they're just LED – a strip of LED lights. And I doubled them up, and I made a little metal frame, and I got to weld it, so it was fun. And, and it, it, to me, it works just fine. I mean, I'm not growing uh, – uh, bonsai or anything. I'm just starting some tomato seeds or cucumber plants or something. And I'm like, just get her done. But uh, what Aaron is doing is, is a couple notches higher. But if you want to start out, well, I would just say get some of those LED shop lights and go with that. Is it better to have light or to have heat? Because I see all these things, these grow mats and things like that to, you know, help warm up the soil underneath your seedlings is it better to have the light or is it better to have warm so you need heat you need bottom heat to have most seeds germinate between 70 and 80 degrees um, so there are some exceptions to that but generally speaking a lot of seeds like that 70 to 80 degrees and you can get that from a heat mat which i i like those and i think that they're they're worth investing and in. they're not that expensive um, just to get them started, and then I move them off the heat mats, and then they're just under the lights. Um, but you can use things like the top of your refrigerator because a lot of seeds do not need light to germinate. So they don't. it doesn't really matter. They don't need to be under the lights at the same time. So once they germinate, you move them off the heat underneath the lights, and you're, and you're good to go on that. Some things, you know, don't – like I just started Snapdragons this weekend and snapdragons want to germinate at 60 degrees. So no heat mat for them, but the heat mat is, is pretty key to getting most things germinated and started, but you don't really need it for the long haul the entire time. Gotcha. I guess one last question I'd have. So the power is out. Do you run the well for the toilets or do you run the lights for the plants? Just curious on the <laughs> generator. <laughs> Depends how long it's going to be out for. I think we're going to start with the well, but if we're talking more than 24 hours, like at some point, you know, we've, we've got a woods here. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. perfect. You could run both. <laughs> One uh, caveat to the led grow lights that you buy from uh, like a nursery supply. Um, Rick radio co-host Rick learned the hard way. If you, you have to pay attention to, the specifications of the lights, but they will put out, they can put out a large amount of UV light. And Rick, I, I'm paraphrasing, but I believe he felt that the growth of his cataracts was accelerated by being exposed to the LED UV light without wearing the special glasses. Yeah, that's actually the reason why we I moved my grow starting area down to the basement. We had been doing it um, in a room that we use. Um, it's now an office. At the time, we sort of used it as a den. But we were sitting in there, and actually it was Rick who, when Rick said that, that's when I started thinking that maybe this wasn't the best idea to have all this stuff sitting out in the part of the house that we're using all the time. So that's why it all moved down to the basement, which is actually perfect in all regards. So it was a good perfect. move anyways. Well, cool. A lot of information for everyone today. So I think they probably, people have reached their destination. They've want, walked from their kitchen up to their spare bedroom and turned on the Zoom <laughs> call. <laughs> We're going to stick around and do an after show for the Garden Fork patrons. If you want to learn more about kind of getting behind the scenes of Eric, I, I just kind of spontaneously post pictures or stuff I'm working on. Like I fixed a propane patio heater and... Aaron learned about that because Aaron's a patron. Um, Will is not, so he didn't learn about that. So, uh, Ooh, burn. But, but we're going to talk about stuff like that in the after show. But anyway, thanks for listening. Um, let me know your thoughts about this. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. Aaron, you can find at the Impatient Gardener on YouTube and her website. Will is at the Weekend Homestead and also the Bear Paw Resort. Um and there you go. I thought that was a great show, everyone. Thank you. 
Garden Fork Radio is produced in Brooklyn, New York by Garden Fork Media, LLC. Our executive producer is Jimmy Gooch. You can learn more about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. The music for our show is licensed from audioblocks.com and uniquetracks.com. Thank you.